Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge & Company. As the most densely populated city in the country, New York has always faced the enormous challenges of providing quality and affordable housing for its residents. Professors Nicholas Bloom and Matthew Gordon Lassner have produced a volume that includes history, commentary, case studies, fascinating visuals, and great photographs called Affordable Housing in New York, the people, places, and policies that transformed a city. And I'm glad to say they're my guests today. So is there such a thing as the goal of providing enough affordable housing in the city? There's never enough affordable housing in the city. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, disparities in income, the structure of the labor market, all of these things conspire to, to, to make this an elusive goal. Um, but one that we find in this book, we've been, we've been uh, chipping away at for over 100 years now. Um, and it's been, I mean, when it started 100 years ago or whenever, it has been a steady growth and a steady a map of different ways to provide it, right? Actually, I mean, I, I would say that in general, each era has called forth a specific mm -hmm. kind of um, typology, a way of building a particular subsidy program. And I think actually if there is any consistency over time, it's that New Yorkers in general have found ways to connect into whatever money was available, uh, either at the local, state, or federal levels. Or could be available, realistically, <laughs> yeah, given yeah, the right. prevailing political but what do we and, and what do we call affordable? I mean, there are lots of, you know, affordable is a big scale. Right. Everything's so affordable, affordable to someone. Right. Exactly. But we have limited the book to this notion of below market. Otherwise, you know, uh, right, I mean, you could have millionaires' apartments on there right. or something like that. But we have um, basically focused the book on below market subsidized housing, which is an enormous sector unto itself. It was big enough for a very large book uh, with many case studies. And so that provides a kind of focus because there you see the patterns. Mm -hmm. right. When I first started thinking about this question to be talked about on the show, I was called you because I wanted to do the history of public housing. Okay. Then you told me you had just published this book. So I'm very glad to have Matt with us. And public housing was the beginning of official provision of no, there were below bef market. All right. um, there, before public housing, well, you, you can talk about it a little bit too, um, but there were basically publicly subsidized, a few developments that were publicly subsidized um, in the 1920s and early 30s. Those are, by you, what? How did um, some of those were union built. Some, right. Um, some were built. And, and, I mean, and, and before that, we have you know, 50 to 75 years of discussion by housing reformers mm -hmm. about the problems of they were called poor houses, housing. Housers, the housers, called exactly. Yeah. Right. And starting in 1910, uh, the 1910s, even before uh, World War I, they're looking to some experiments in Western Europe where you start to see mm public funds going for financing of nonprofit housing mm -hmm. and, and, and that sort of thing. And, and this idea emerges that there should be various kinds of public subsidies And settlement, housing. it's from the, all the settlement organizations. Comes out of the settlement Absolutely. houses and, and people, you know, by and large people who are doing work in neighborhoods like the Lower East Side and in some other cities. And it's a basic belief that housing is a human right. That good quality housing well, is a human right. And it's the quality that matters because, you know, people had housing, they were living in a room with no windows. Yeah. Um, but, but the idea was that, that everyone in should this be. country should enjoy a higher standard. Yeah. Well, there's also the dimension, though, of course, people like Mary Simkovich and others mm -hmm. who were these reformers who had started Greenwich House and so forth. There is also a strong element of social control as well. That is, they're, mm -hmm. they're working with people in settlement houses, but they're realizing they're going home to these places which are essentially, um, you know, very poor quality housing, very densely developed. And, you know, there are neighborhoods filled with bars and saloons and so forth. So they don't know what the thought is they have to be educated. They don't know. Not only educated, but their entire environment, right? <laughs> their entire environment has to be redesigned. Yeah, the city in a sense is seen as, it's something worth saving, but it's also the seen city. as the enemy. And it's interesting because there actually is a lot of discussion early on about underconsumption of housing. There was this idea on the part of reformers that these poor immigrants were, were, cho were sort of opting to live in substandard housing to save money, to send their kids to college, that sort of thing, and that we needed to find ways to get them to spend, uh, spend, spend more money on housing to live more like <laughs> you know, native-born Americans. And, but then it's interesting because the early days of the Housing Authority, mm -hmm. public housing, there was control also. 
Oh, there Absolutely. was enormous that control. Control. So right. let's talk about public housing. Sure. Who started it, the concept in, this, in the state? Was it with Al Smith that came? I mean, what official? Well, so the 1910s the and 20s, you have reformers who are saying we need a system of public housing. And it wasn't clear what that would necessarily mean. A lot of people were suggesting something much broader than what we ended up with. Yeah. They're saying we need, you know, a, 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 a cash subsidies. We need uh, tax abatements. We need low interest, long, long term mortgages. Um, it was discussed in the 20s. It didn't happen. And then we get the Depression. Right. Um, and there you get, I mean, the, the leadership more more. of the Hurley. I mean, you get LaGuardia is obviously an enormous mm -hmm. uh, fan of it. But we, we, in the book, for instance, we have a lot on uh, Catherine Bauer, who mm -hmm. was uh, a major kind of writer and it's also... It was all these women. There were, it was. Women. Yeah, Well, many. they were, all, in a sense, women were in this sort of the extension of kind of this idea of domesticity yeah, it's the into, same. it was like you could be a public figure like Mary Simcovich, who not only was a, a leader of Greenwich House, right, but she becomes one of the founding members of the Housing Authority, mm -hmm. right? So she's moving into municipal governance, mm -hmm. right? But because it's housing and there are families involved, this was kind of an acceptable place mm -hmm. to expand, you know, the sort of women's leadership. And these are women who have been written out of the history of urban planning and well you know what the feminists what we say <laughs> and but they're uncomfortable so figures in some ways though i mean because yeah. mary simkovich i mean she endorses for instance the kinds of social control mm -hmm. right the kind of careful tenant selection the working tenancy the clearance of neighborhoods and even actually in the 1930s for instance the even though new york token integrated its developments but she even basically underlines this idea that there will be kind of this neighborhood preference for housing. Mm -hmm. So in a way, that, that's why it's difficult for, I think, feminists in some ways to embrace someone like Simkovich because the attitudes of that era are so it's different. Interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. But even, even but the figures like Edith Elmer Wood, who was, mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. did a PhD in, in political economy at Columbia, who was the first person in this country to really articulate the need for a system of public housing. So, well, let's go to the public housing okay. and the public housing authority. Yeah. So over the years, I mean, it started the legislation was state and then city, federal. I mean, well, the, the Senator housing Wagner, it was yeah. housing, federal housing, right? Well, the, the state of New York, in partnership with the city, basically creates mm -hmm. the housing authority. And we're mm -hmm. first out the door. The first housing programs really are work programs through various federal New Deal programs and so forth. WPA. Um, so New York is really kind of pushing even before. It's not till 1937. The housing authority is 34. It's not till 37 you have a federal program of the kind of public housing we think of today. And um, I, I think that's kind of crucial, is New York is, is a leader even then in setting up public housing. Mm -hmm. and, th and there's a lot of uh, uh, different ideas about whether the federal government will sort of build housing directly or will go through cities and how that will work legally. And the, oh, and the, the, the housing authority itself is, the, is, is a pretty ingenious construction. Oh, it well, it was. It I was. mean, I would say this, that not only, right, was it this pass-through, right, for federal cash, and then ultimately, also New York, even in the 30s, creates a city and state public housing program, but they also give it enormous powers, which it can't use anymore, of <laughs> course, but like eminent domain, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. these are enormous. Or selling, New York used to sell NYCHA bonds. Mm. It was a great investment yeah, for right. a lot of people, right? right? And there's a small bond program, but it's very limited. Um, but these were enormous. They were also separate from city government. So they created this enormous independent, a semi-independent agency. Uh, with but they depended on funds. I mean, Absolutely. Absolutely. We do. There's a small city program, a, a small right. state program in New York is unique in that we see municipal and state commitment yeah. to the idea of public housing. But what New York really does is once we set up the housing authority, we're also it's New Yorkers, along with a few people from Chicago. I'm being a bit chauvinistic <laughs> here, but it's really New Yorkers who are going to Washington mm -hmm. and saying, you know, mm -hmm. we're never going to get a lot done unless you the go. whole country gets behind this. And and, and, and you know, even before public housing passes in 37, under the uh, PWA, under the New Deal right. programs, we see money coming, uh, becoming available for public housing in New York, you know, it's taking the lion's it. share of it, and we're ready to hit the ground running, but, but we're there uh, uh, fighting for, for federal money. So the federal money came, mm -hmm. the housing authority ran these buildings very well, mm -hmm. the maintenance was top level, the selection was always a problem because they wanted it to be integrated and well, it was difficult sometimes? There were a number of selection issues. Yeah. One was that the housing authority in these early years, 
uh, well, actually until really the 1960s, they're looking for tenants who can pay a rent that basically can cover the operating costs. There are basically the federal subsidies for construction and so forth. But this notion of a, a deep, like at now, right, there's a deep federal subsidy just to operate. Mm-hmm. There's a big capital subsidy as well. And so they were very selective. So even in the 30s, for instance, very few of the site tenants got into public housing. All right? And this got worse really as time went on, that this enormous con- clearance. That's a continuation through urban right. renewal and everything, right? Right, because they had, for instance, the 21 Absolutely. factors. You couldn't yeah. have, like, for instance, one of the things that made it difficult to get into public housing was lack of furniture or a social service case history. They would do site visits at your old Absolutely. apartment I early on, that. make so sure that you, you know, were tidy and, and ran a good home. And, yeah. and some of this is, is local decisions, and some yeah. of it is federal. Right. I mean, you can imagine then as now the idea of providing public federal subsidies for low-income families was controversial. And there's a lot of discussion about who deserves this aid right. and who doesn't. And, and, and so some of these tensions are built in right from the get-go, so for the 60s, better or worse. And then the 60s come along, and then every, you know, we had the welfare hotel crisis and so forth. So by the late 1960s, basically advocates for the very poor kind of look at this housing authority in New York and say, you know, in other cities, you, know, you have much higher rates of people who are in public assistance in public housing. Why in New York are we at maybe 10% of residents? This is housing which is, you know, the government is subsidizing at some level, we, that needs to be for those who most need it, because that's really how welfare and essentially or our, our government programs work at some level. For well, New York was always more generous with welfare, so they had people well, coming here, right? Yes. So that it was always feeding into the need for housing. Absolutely. They were, right. So then uh, it was interesting to me that the mayors, all of them, you can't really fault them with their housing policies, can you? I mean, they may not have been enough. But their intention was always to find more affordable housing. Is that right? Absolutely. I mean, going yeah. back to the 20s, the, yeah. the, 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 the LaGuardia, the, even O'Dwyer in the late 40s and, and early 50s, and then Wagner and Lindsay. And, you know, there were ups and downs, and some um, um, had kind of more <laughs> unconventional ideas and, and tested new experiments that, that didn't necessarily didn't work. work. But, but, but every mayor has been, um, uh, as, uh, housing has been central to they're all men, to his agenda. And there's an electoral dimension here. I mean, it's not entirely that, but there's a kind of iterative process, right, is that if you actually go out and campaign in New York, I mean, one of the things you're going to hear from people is, right, you can't either for your kids or older people have trouble finding quality, affordable housing. So I think that in a way that even in an era, for instance, with Koch, right, where there was a lot of belt tightening in the city, Mm -hmm. as you well know, right, that still the city basically found, basically financed, right, this program because, again, um, there was such enormous need for, again, this this basically below market subsidized but that was, housing. Now, that was a different program, wasn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. That, that was a different kind of that program. That wasn't doing public housing as, instu- you know, as things. Absolutely not. That became what? what scatter site? Is that when scatter site housing came? N- that's that's oh, earlier. That's, that's earlier. even That's even 60s and, and mm-hmm. uh, late 60s mm-hmm. and early 70s. There were a lot of concerns about racial segregation mm-hmm. in housing and the way the public housing was set up um, uh, both federally and locally. Uh, you know, you have to work with communities, and it, communities basically had to opt in and participate in this yeah, process, right. so you, it ends up being segregated spatially. The Koch era really is defined, I think, it, the real, there, there is sort of a watershed in this period for a number of reasons, is that when you really look at, you know, Mitchell Lama, and aside from the, some of the experiments, like the Upper West Side or Renewal Area and so forth, but when you really look at housing the below market subsidized areas before the late 1970s, it's a very top-down process. I mean, that Absolutely, is, for low income and for middle income, whether it's right. NYCHA building public housing or Michelama or the unions and United Housing Foundation doing, you know, places mm-hmm. like Co-op City in Rochdale what Village. What do you mean and, it's top down? That is the decisions about sites. Oh. All right. Um, how the the organization of the housing companies, by and large, were these you know large, let's say the United Housing Foundation, the New York City Housing Authority, and so forth. Um, they were these very sort of uh, centralized, large organizations with what turned out to be very often a fairly deep subsidy models. They had enormous support as well from city government and so forth in basically you know these very big programs, and that because of the early 1970s financial crisis, the changing political sort of character of, of America, right? Those programs are gone, and I guess the resistance. And well. local resistance, Absolutely. so you can't build a project like 
Penn South in Chelsea. Or Queensbridge House. You know, without generating a tremendous amount of resistance from existing tenants. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and, you know, in, in an interesting parallel to what's happening today in neighborhoods like East Harlem uh, being mm -hmm. considered for upzoning, uh, the the resistance to uh, the, the the Title One Urban Renewal Project that cleared much of Chelsea for Penn South was 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 about access to the new housing that was going to come. People are saying they're not necessarily saying we love our tenements, we don't want to see redevelopment. They're saying we're not going to be able to afford to live in this so-called affordable housing. Uh, that wasn't the term that was used, but that was the spirit of the critique. We're not going to be able to afford to live here. So is that what's happening now with the mayor's most recent proposal? There's a good deal of concern among communities that that the, uh, the upzoning, which of course is designed to serve as a carrot to realize, uh, to, to get private developers or nonprofit developers to carry the weight of producing below market units. Uh, there's a lot of fear that that's going to encourage demolition and, mm -hmm. and lead to new market rate housing and, and even the replacement of affordable housing uh, won't be accessible either because they won't qualify uh, in terms of, of you know, sort of uh, their income. Uh, and even if they do qualify, there's a lottery. You know, we get hundreds or thousands of applications Tens for every thousands, unit right. um, uh, that Such we produce. And, and that's not new. You can go back. We have some great pictures in the book from the 1980s of housing lotteries where right. you have piles of mail up to here yeah. uh, and, 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 you know, Ed Koch picking names out of a <laughs> basket. But right. if somebody's making $10 an hour, it's a single parent family with two children, can they afford? What can they afford? <laughs> Well, a family, at that, a family at that level would basically need a double subsidy in order to live in affordable housing. And Absolutely. in fact, um, a significant number of the new affordable buildings accept the Section 8 uh, vouchers mm -hmm. and so forth. So, um, no, I, I mean, if you look at the income levels, they're, they're far in excess of, let's say, a $10 an hour mm -hmm. um, level. Um, because, and, here's, and we get back to what sort of changed in the 70s, which is that the programs that came along uh, after the 1970s, they don't come with an annual, you know, people, we complain, for instance, that, for instance, NYCHA's uh, federal operating subsidy is only, you know, 89% of what the Congress should pay. <laughs> well, there is no annual operating subsidy for the new affordable housing that comes along unless there's a separate like Section 8 voucher that a, a resident brings with them to this development. So what that means is that in order for the nonprofit groups, the community development groups, and also the for-profit developers who now do affordable housing, for it to be at all, you know, they, <laughs> for their model, they have to have a much wider range and, quite frankly, a higher income level than you see in just the straight-up so, subsidized I've always area. felt in all the discussion about affordable housing, and I'm I'm not using your, um, you know, whatever the subsidized. Below market below, subsidized. Below you, market. you can say affordable. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Is there still no housing for the poor? No. Other than shelters. Well, public shelters housing. or public housing. Public, public housing, housing and Section 8. But in the fact, interesting the thing about profile, public housing yeah. is a low percentage of welfare tenants actually in public mm -hmm. housing. I think that was a, that's a surprising number. It is. It's uh, about what? 11 or 12% yeah. at this point. I Down from a most, high of 20%. Right. But it was I, never all... Not in New York, in a place like Chicago or St. Louis, very high. Uh -huh. um, uh, it, it became that way. By we, the reached, we reached in New York, the high point in the 1990s was about 30% of uh, public mm -hmm. assistance system-wide. However, we should be clear that uh, there were developments that had much higher rates. Mm. And in the many of those developments in the Rockaways and elsewhere, you had the kind of right. concentration of poverty and other kinds of issues, which was quite problematic. And they're the ones so, that are further away. Yeah, right. from a central absolutely, activity. absolutely, right. and um, so that's did and we learn that lesson? Services. We did, we did, and we moved. I mean, this is during the Giuliani years, um, mm -hmm. and the federal government was basically supporting these types of, of changes. Mm -hmm. But we went to the working family preference in mm -hmm. the 1990s. One of every that. two families, uh, it's still in place, and well, that's one factor. So they really basically kind of moved people up the line who had uh, work. That's one factor. But the other factor is there's welfare programs as a whole have been slashed dramatically in New York. Right. I mean, the percentage <laughs> of families getting no welfare. Right. So, right. 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 so what we know is, you know, a lot of people are supported uh, either through Food social security. Well, yeah. social security sure, is big. Absolutely. We have an aging population in public mm -hmm. housing. Disability is a growing area as well. And food stamps. Right. So it's and never, senior poverty is different. It's really not a solvable problem. <laughs> Can we say that? I mean, because yes. we're always growing. It's right. It's a... 
it's, it, you know, it, we, don't, we don't move people through and then out. <laughs> we just keep moving people in. By and large, by and large. And that's a, that's a problem that we didn't have 30 years ago, yeah. but it's a problem that we have today, absolutely. Right. And, and, and you know, th there probably is some limit, and I think people at the Department of City Planning have conversations about this. I mean, how much housing could we possibly build? Is there a maximum yeah. kind of population if, we were, if the sky were the limit in terms of... You know, well, the... Work? Yeah. The other thing is that this actually happened back Cost in the 50s estate. and 60s. Well, that's the thing. The, the oh. individual units now, I mean, some of the most beautiful developments that have been built are $400,000 per apartment, which, for instance, in the Poconosa house is, you know, $200,000 right. or something so like that. So you find that's what happens, right? Mm -hmm. For the, that working class, they move out. They do. They move very far out. They endure the longer commutes very often. Very, but they have to move beyond our, our sort of closer in suburbs very often, except mm -hmm. in New Jersey. Because the other issue we should talk about a lot is that, you know, the New York City is trying to solve, in essence, what is a regional housing problem. That is, there's kind of regional market failure. Mm -hmm. And New York City is 8 million people. Depending on where you say the region stops, you know, it's 17 or 18 million. So we, we probably have as many or more people in the region. There's more land out there, but it's almost all off limits. Right, so New York City is, you know, think about it. Are there really no homeless people in Westchester? There are only a couple shelters, right? No, I mean, people, we, there are poor cities in Westchester and elsewhere, but they're not providing the same yeah. level we, of, of it, I mean, housing. The housing authority, they're trying to move people. You say aging, you age in place. Mm -hmm. So you had two or three kids, you had a large apartment. Absolutely. You're now there and you're there, right? right. <laughs> and people... Even, I guess, in Mitchell Amas and middle income, have they tried that too? I think they have at some point. I'm not sure. Uh, less so than in NYCHA. You can move people out of where they are. It's very difficult. And, 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 and <laughs> they will knock on your door and ask you if you'd like to move into a one-bedroom apartment. But right. part of the problem is, is that even people whose kids have grown up and moved out, there is a kind of informal... Uh, economy that yeah. happens there yeah. with, with extended families cycling through who Absolutely. may not be on the lease. Are they airbnb or whatever you I, 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 uh, Who knows? <laughs> I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put it past people to do yeah. that. But on public housing... I'm sure they, there is, I, I, but a different way, yeah. Um, in public housing, I'm not sure how successful... I mean, they try as well yeah. to move people along, right. but, you know, possession is nine-tenths yeah. of the law, even so, with public housing. So that just goes to show, I mean, there's so many different forces coming in, the gentrification of a neighborhood, the increasing cost of land, of building, and all that kind of stuff. And then the fact that you don't move from one place to another too much. I mean, the Mitchell Lamas in our neighborhood. No. You know, nobody, except nobody's... Except the ones that have bought out. Yes. Of the all the Mitchell Lamas now are what we call NORCs, naturally yes, occurring right. retirement communities. Because right. people... And, and, where they start. And, yeah. and especially the ones in Manhattan, you know, right. Penn South, like I keep talking about Penn South, they're Penn South, you know, they had... The, last year, they, the lottery opened for a place on the waiting list. You know, it was the first time in, I think, 14 I, years. So by the time you yeah. actually, you know, get an apartment, you're right. old, even if you're young when you apply. <laughs> right. What I loved is the, the story about Penn South and uh, the political... Uh, scene there, the the whole socialist. It's basically a socialist, I guess. Basically. Bernie Sanders land. We can be sure of that. Yes. I knew David Smith very well as he went through these whole things, and it, it's so interesting. I mean, they are a big development that chooses year after year not to buy out, so they can sell their apartments at market rate. Mm -hmm. And it, they're committed to it, right? They really are. They really are. I think I think people there are very much believe in the vision of affordable housing. They're aware of their roots in the union movement. At the same time, it's also, as I point out, it's a, it's a practical matter. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they simply... Where are they going to go? Well, <laughs> where are they going to go? And if, if, if it were to buy out of mitchell and they were paying full property taxes, the, the yeah. tenants there couldn't afford, afford to stay. Pay. Right, and you look at the large developments uh, like Co-op City and Rochdale Village yeah. and so forth, um, and these also are ones that have stayed under these programs for the financial reasons. That is, the Legacy. state has constantly, well, I mean, there, there's the politics of maintaining an affordable mm -hmm. price, but really, they, because they need basically the state financing in order to maintain the affordability. So if they left the program, they would basically be responsible for going out in the private mortgage market. And it's tough, even as a co-op. And then you see the other things, the smaller buildings in Brooklyn and, and some of the neighborhoods where their building is sold and the landlord comes along and he says, uh, you know, I'll give you $3,000 if you move or I'll give you 5000 So that's part of the gentrification project that pushes those people out. God knows where they can go. Well, in, we do have the map um, in yes. the book that shows the um, 
stabilization and rent control across the city, and we as it once was. <laughs> right, it's yeah, that's, yeah it's no, 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 no. We it's exactly. Yeah. We it, it's it's everything that was once uh, rent control and rent Let's, stabilized. I mean, I love what what some of these projects have generated, and you have a whole section about hip hop. Yes. <laughs> so tell me about hip hop. Well, I mean, what it, we our is focus. The map you met? Yeah, that's the, the map. that's the map yeah. where we tried yeah. to to, 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 to make the various subsidy programs legible. Yeah. And we grouped a lot of the programs together. And it's so interesting because it's a large part of the city. It really is it's a city-wide yeah. program. I mean, it's not just all in East Harlem yeah. or the South Bronx, right. which obviously you know we do probably see the greatest concentration mm -hmm. in those areas or, or Bedford Stuyvesant. But our focus in in hip hop in the, the essay in the book uh, is about um, that these places both. Um, publicly subsidized private buildings in places like the Bronx, but also with the public housing developments, they had a lot of public space. And that included community centers and other places where people could gather. And so that these basically low cost spaces we could gather for parties and so forth. And now even in public housing, for instance, there are recording studios mm -hmm. and so forth. So it has become kind of self-sustaining over time. But the other piece we like about hip hop as well, and I think is very important, and we have tried also throughout the book, is there's also some dissent about what the meaning of public housing is, that the way people, for instance, who live in public housing, look at public housing, it's an asset, but there's also, in this sense, kind of, um, uh, th there's some question about the aesthetics, you know, the location, the isolation amongst people who live in these developments as well. There's and certainly a visual stigma. We have this other new proposal, too, that we're going to sell off some of that land and, and build more. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes. The question is market rate housing or subsidized housing. <laughs> There's, there, there, is it possible? There, there are many, many questions there. And one question is, um, what choices does the city have, does the housing authority have mm -hmm. in terms of moving forward and getting the resources that we need to stabilize um, this housing and, and keep up what we've got? Um, uh, and, 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 and then there's a sort of separate question about how we should use that land. So we've come to the end of this program, and I, we haven't even touched what I'd like to talk about. So are you, do you think we're going to um, add to the affordable? I mean, you guys, you guys are optimistic. Right? Absolutely. Yes. I mean, we, we're even, it's just a even on, on, even at NYCHA, for instance, the, the programs that are moving forward in terms of infill and have already moved forward mm -hmm. are right. new affordable developments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look at Arbor House at Forest Houses in, in the Bronx. It's a beautiful building, privately developed, 100% affordable mm -hmm. to 60% AMI to start getting into wonky yeah. uh, terms yeah. about affordability, but but there are models, but mm -hmm. but that model is also not going to provide NYCHA with the resources that it needs to stabilize it's, the system. The really, the city is going to have to. It already is. The, the city's already basically transferring a lot of yeah. the responsibility because right. the police and you all needed that. a big yeah. affordable... Yeah. Or sorry, no, I'm sorry, but oh, we, yeah. we're going to have to end. Okay. You're going to have to come back, I think, <laughs> because, you know, I mean, there has to be a political will that's going to force some of these people in government at different levels to finally realize what they have to do, right? Absolutely, and we have okay. to go to Albany and, and Washington, yeah, too. So people interested in this should definitely read this book because it's not only interesting and fascinating, it's, um, it's just so informative. It'll set you off on a course. Thank you guys very much. Thank you for having Thanks us. Thanks for having us. This If there are any people you'd like to hear or topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.